Welcome to the Pat Sheranian Show. Thank you so much for joining us today. I have a wonderful guest, and he has a wonderful book that I want you to know about, so I want you to stay with us. My guest is Clark Burbage. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank nice you so much here. for joining me today. And we're Pleasure. going to go to commercial, but we'll be right back. I'm back. This is Pat Sheranian, and I want you to know how happy I am to be broadcasting again. Please join me and friends at 12 o'clock noon on KHQN, 1480 AM, and on the internet, pat.utahvalleylive.com. We talk about religion, politics, local businesses, relationships, and more. Join in the conversation in our chat room with your questions and comments or call 801-362-9552. 801-362-9552. I'm back. All right, we're back. Thank you very much for being with us on KHQN 1480 AM. We appreciate our radio listeners. We find out that you're driving cars. Some of you are on jobs where you can listen to the radio, and we appreciate all of you being with us. Some of you are home decorating your Christmas tree and getting ready for this big, wonderful time of year that is so special to all of us. I particularly wanted Clark to come on this week with me because this is a story that will touch your heart. It'll touch your heart, your children, your grandparents. It's a, a, it's actually a book for all ages. Those are so rare anymore. It's like a movie. Where can you find a movie for all ages? It's really difficult. And the same with books. And this book was written for every single age. It's a short story. You can read it in 15 minutes. And it's the most beautiful book I have picked up in years and years. I actually went out to uh, meet Clark last week. We chatted on the phone, and I went out to see him. He was signing at Deseret Book out in Orem, and uh, that's always a wonderful experience, but you never know how it's going to go. But I understand you were out in two different Deseret Books on what, Friday and Saturday? One on, <coughs> one on Friday, downtown Salt Lake, and okay. two on Saturday here in Utah County. Okay, mm-hmm. so you were doing good. Well, we uh, we had a great experience. The illustrator was at two of those with me, oh, and uh, so that's always fun when you get two signatures for the price of one. But well, that's great. But uh, yeah, all the books in the stores were sold out at each one of those locations, so they were frantically reordering by the end of the day. Ah, oh, that feels good. Desert book that's, is always good to reorder from. <laughs> that is a good problem to have. <laughs> it's good for an author. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to give you a number because uh, Clark just made an offer, and uh, we're going to give away two books. So we'll give one to the first caller and the fifth caller, and the number to call is 801-362-9552, 801-362-9552. Now, I can't take that call on the air because it is a cell phone, but I will pick it up as soon as we're off the air, and it'll obviously be recorded with your name and phone number. So first one in gets a book, and fifth caller gets a book. And you can just work that out (laughs) and figure out how to make that happen. And we appreciate that very much because it is a book that's about $18 with tax and all. But it is certainly a book that you want to have because this is a book like so few anymore that you can put out all year long. I thought this is a great coffee table book because it needs to be there. And if every... Every doctor's office, every office ought to have this on the table because when wouldn't you want to read this book? It's written so gently, and the ending comes very quickly, but it's profound, I will tell you. I couldn't hold back the tears, and uh, it's, it's just wonderful. So let's find out about the author first, and then we're going to talk to you about the book. Uh, so where are you from? Well, I was born in Ogden, Utah. Grew up in Salt Lake City, went to school in, in, you know, in the Salt Lake City area. What high school? Uh, Skyline High School. Skyline. And mm-hmm. then did you go to the U? I went to the University of Utah okay. for undergraduate school and then down to the University of Southern California for USC. graduate school. Yes, I did. Oh, yeah. Where were you living when you went to USC? Down? We lived uh, off campus uh, a couple of miles right, right in the Crenshaw District and... Uh, it was kind of an interesting place at night. That's a nice way to put it, an interesting place. <laughs> well, people are wonderful they down are. there. You just have to cut down your exposure after dark. That's, that's right. That's the, how you learn the, to live. Stay that's off right. the streets. <laughs> but it was a wonderful place to go to school. And then I stayed down there and worked for 13 years and, and then eventually the, moved back here. Was that the Wilshire Ward District? Were you in Wilshire uh, Ward? That was in our stake. Oh, that was okay. in our stake. I was in the student ward, uh, that, which is a combination married and singles ward. So you were in the Los Angeles stake. Right, right, okay. in the Los Angeles stake. Then I lived out in uh, Glendale, La Cunata, in, in this, uh, another that stake area. out there. Sure. Mm-hmm. That's great. So then where did you wind up? 
Well, moved back here, back here in, in the early 90s uh, into Davis County, lived okay. in Bountiful for a number of years, and I currently reside in Woods Cross. Oh, nice. So That's I now nice. refer to myself as Farmer Bird. <laughs> Farmer Bird. <laughs> That's funny. All right. <clears throat> now, there's always a reason that a person begins writing. Uh, maybe they had a dream in school somewhere along the way, an English teacher that was uh, very kind to them and paid the right compliment at the right moment. Uh, have you been doing this all your life, or is this something? What, what have you been doing with yourself? What did you graduate in? Well, I graduated in business, <laughs> oh, well, that's which an easy, requires that's an easy, easy segue. <laughs> requires you to write a lot, uh, to analyze a lot. Finance was my area. Lots of board presentations, lots of packages written. I spent uh, about 25 years in the investment banking business, and now I'm a CFO uh, on my third round with the third different company. But the, there are two are things I learned. Are interested in your third different company? Uh, I work for iTalk, which is in uh, Lehigh. Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we do Wait computer. a minute. You're driving from Woods Cross to Lehigh? Uh, opposite way of traffic, but it's not too bad. Okay. When, you, when you've d lived in L.A., that's just a well, stone stroll. I started stroll. to say, when I moved up here, everybody <laughs> said, well, it's way up in Lehigh from Provo. I thought, yeah. are you kidding me? I've been driving from Westwood mm -hmm. Beverly Hills down to L.A. for years and years and not an easy trip. But being a finance guy <laughs> seems very different than riding. But it does teach you how to be meticulous, uh, to be careful, to do whatever you do with a high degree of quality because you don't want to make mistakes. And if, uh, if the editing process that you go through after you write anything is, is anything, it's painstaking. So it did prepare me for that part of it. The other thing that it does to you, if you haven't gotten in the business world, you develop a tough skin. I have learned this <coughs> from having authors on the air with me and knowing them personally. Uh, rewrites and rewrites and rewrites and people who criticize your writing uh, because it often goes through two edits for content and grammatical error and yes. uh, it, it can be very very painful or somebody says I don't get it and someone else says it's the history is too much uh, I need more of the story and less history about it and I know a dear friend Helene Holt and in her first book I know of 57 rewrites that she gave that book and now it's in a screenplay Mm -hmm. and more and you I mean she's a tender little soul she's gotten tough over the years because you have to toughen up if you're going to take the if you're going to write the book and or write the screenplay you've got to take the criticism yes there's a delicate balance between taking it personally and learning That's from the it. process That's and these key. people are pros they know what they're doing they know the market you're going into and so I, I needed to take that advice and be serious about it but also try to preserve my voice. And one of the great blessings you can have when you, when you work with a right publisher who has good editors that respect your work and they aren't trying to turn it into their own work. Right. Is they respect your voice. And so they, they edit you. They give you the difficult comments that you have to take positively and continue smiling <laughs> and learn from them. And no tears. Can't that's, cry. <laughs> that's right. You, you really can cry afterwards. <laughs> But you really, it's, it's uh, it, true in business. Um, I remember the day I said, uh, women don't cry anymore. You, you just can't in the business world. That's the first thing a woman has to learn in the business world. Stand there and take it. And when you can't anymore, then you have to, you're an executive at that point, and you can ask them to stop talking <laughs> and fire them. <laughs> right. And so, but being an author is so sensitive because you live the words. One of the things I found in this book was I was there. And you did that very quickly. You brought me right there. I could feel it, smell it, taste it, experience it. And I thought that was very interesting because sometimes it takes a while to get into a plot. Mm -hmm. And But this is a short little book. It's, a, it's almost like a snapshot of what happens. And you managed to get that all in one frame. It's really been an, it was a good experience. I waited till last night to read it because I wasn't sure what my reaction would be. I thought, well, just, you know, a nice book. No, it's a phenomenal little story, the way it's told. It's an old story. We read it in the scriptures every year, if not more. And uh, you've managed to take it and turn it into an absolute jewel. In fact, the name of the book is A Piece of Silver. And we're going to talk about that, why that title. And, uh, but I want to go back to you're in the finance world. Now, something, yeah, okay, so you're writing. I understand writing business plans understand proposals, understand all of that, but then sitting down and writing about, 
a subject that has been well discussed for thousands of years. What was the, where did you cross over and say, okay, I'm able to do this particular kind of book? Right. Well, I've always written stories for my family. I've oh, written I didn't music know that. Okay. Uh, going way back. <clears throat> and so I have uh, my wife and I kid each other that I was a uh, right brain person stuck in a left brain world. <laughs> but <laughs> creativity true. helps you in the left brain world too. Um, however, I was, uh, I was actually out of work in 2010 when I decided to publish this. And it goes, the story really goes back to 2006. I just finished going through a, a period that we all have uh, in our lives, one that tries you, that forces you to your knees, that, uh, that changes you forever as a result of it. And uh, it was unexpected. I came through that period uh, almost... Uh, almost broken. You, sometimes you think you're doing fine, and you look back, and you, you, you really weren't doing that well. We have a lot of people right now, mm -hmm. <coughs> which is one reason you're on this week. Oh. We have a lot of people out of work and discouraged. Right, and, and, and when, you, when you have those kind of challenges in your life, uh, especially when they're combined with uh, other challenges, kind of a perfect storm combination of things that all seem to go wrong at the same time, it pushes you to the very limit. You want to share just a little bit? Oh, I, I, I went through a, a divorce. I have a blended family now. I'm remarried, and, and it was a devastating experience. I, 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 you know, it's personal, intensely personal, but, but to anyone who's been through something like that uh, can appreciate um, what it does to your life, how it changes how you think about yourself and everything else that goes on around you. One of you. the main things that I find, no matter what level a person has been working, whether they've been a laborer or they're sitting as a CEO in an office, mm -hmm. it just is devastating to your worth. Yeah. It seems to hit uh, the very core of your being. You find yourself out of work and unloved and confused about so many things. And I it is, it is the one common denominator that we seem to have. Smile is a common denominator. But there's another thing that happens when we become very, very discouraged. The feelings are very similar from one person to the next, regardless of income, right. regardless of circumstances. We allow, unfortunately, we allow those feelings to get to us. And then you have to begin. I know I said the other day on the air, I'm going to say it again, particularly at this time of the year. Um, the Lord went through Gethsemane. He did not build a house and plant a garden. He went through it. And often I have met people over the years who get discouraged and live there. They stay there. They cannot seem to make themselves get out or take that step. So one of my missions is to have enough joy around at all times where we can just at least catch hold of a bite of it, just a little bit. Maybe it's a small life raft for someone to have a laugh during the day or a smile and to know that Life is going to be better. And that's what you did. You took your life, because I didn't know that. You took your life and you said, I'm going to do something different. Well, yes. In 2006, I was two, two years on the other side of it. I was remarried to a wonderful woman who had also been through a similar experience. We combined our two sets of five children, so we now have, we're like the Brady Bunch, we're you were. ten. <laughs> okay. And, and it's Christmas time. And it's Christmas time, which I, I tell my wife, that just means I have to be really, really good at what I do. <laughs> But um, uh, in 2006, it was also this very time of year between Thanksgiving and Christmas, and I had an opportunity to be thinking about the, the wonderful change my life had gone in the last the two years, be the year before, uh, once I kind of came out of the, the dark tunnel. And um, I was so grateful. I, I realized that we can go through terrible, terrible experiences, and that doesn't mean we're broken. Good. It's and, true. And if we face forward and move forward instead of looking back and dwelling on the terrible experiences and try to continue to make something and build again, that that changes your whole outlook. Let's and say that again because that is the key. I, I find in uh, meeting people that they want to rehash the past and try and make it right, or try right. and get through the guilt, or try and get over some part of whatever they contributed to it, or what someone did to <coughs> them. Mm -hmm. I'm guilty of the same thing. And it happens sometime when you don't least expect it. You think, I'm on top of my game, everything's going great, and then boom, something happens and you float back into that past. It's constant, but say it again, you have to. You need to look forward. First of all, recognize you have value. 
that you're not broken, uh, that you still have a purpose, and that there must be some plan here you don't see clearly, and look for, forward and go, go to it. Um, that's Sometimes what I did. Sometimes it's just getting up. Yes. Yeah. Well, I've talked with, I've counseled a lot of individuals, and and in fact, my sons, when they they were struggling through school, I'd say, you know, the first thing you have to do in the morning is get is sit up and put your feet on the ground. That's it. You got to get up. And once you do that, once you do that, you're out of bed, and the rest the rest follows. But you got to make that first move. Anyway, in in 2006, I sat down at this very time of year, feeling very grateful. Uh, and uh, uh, and this story came to me all at once one evening. It just rushed in. Uh, I wrote it down in about an hour and a half. And of course, as a as a as an author, forever every time I read it, you're constantly editing. And uh, then we sent it out as a Christmas card to some of our close friends and family members. I've done readings over the last five years with, with no pictures, of course, no art, but the story is touching. And then uh, finally in 2010, I was in between jobs again. That's what we call it nowadays. We're not out of work. We're in between <laughs> right. jobs. In between jobs. And uh, I had some time. And I decided, well, I'm, I'm networking. I'm looking for work. Um, why don't I put a couple of these stories down and see what happens? The, the publishing industry is a tough one. But it's no tougher than what I've experienced. And so I thought, well, I know how to network. I know how to start businesses. This is like starting your own business and networking. I'll just apply those principles. And you know what? I found out that authors are a wonderful group of people. They'll reach out. They'll respond to you. They'll give you their advice. um, And they'll give you guidance and suggestions. And and I thrive on that. So one thing led to another. And and the book you see before you is my second book, actually. And and uh, and this one has uh, turned out to be uh, very gratifying, both for me personally and I, I think to many who read oh, it. Oh, to many. But let's go back because you mentioned something I didn't know. So let's okay. talk about your first book. Oh, well, the first book I wrote um, also happened during that, that year of 2010. And it's, it's called Life on the Narrow Path. A Mountain Biker's Guide to Spiritual Growth in Troubled Times. That's quite a title. <laughs> yes, well, that's a sub, subtitle. I that. But, but it talks about practical... Give, give the title again. Life on the Narrow Path. It's in all the major bookstores and, and online. And Clark Burbage, in case you've just joined us. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're talking about his book, A Piece of Silver. Well, no, we're not. We've got his book, A Piece of Silver. We're going to talk about it, but he's now telling us, give us the title again. Is it out? Is it out? Can we buy it? Um, oh, yeah. You can buy it in who, all the major we? bookstores okay. and online. Online, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the book is simply... Give me the title again. Life on the Narrow Path. Okay. And we'll just let you... Life on the Narrow Path. We that's easy to that. remember. Okay. And uh, it's, it's very straightforward. It takes each chapter in parable form and talks about a principle of outdoor activities, in this case primarily mountain biking, but swimming and scuba diving and other things as well, things I know well over many years. It talks about a specific principle, and then the second half of that chapter relates it in a very practical way to, uh, to us and how we can maintain our spiritual momentum and growth when we face difficult times and prepare for that. And then the la- there are some chapters in there for those who are in a position to be guides to those who are struggling oh, as well. So it looks at it from <laughs> like a 360. Mentor, like a mentor? Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. So it's really written for 20, 30, 40-year-olds who are going through some of those challenges we all face in life for the first time, marriage, family, struggles. Are those some of your chapters? And just name some of the chapters. Um, the first <laughs> chapter, for example, is called Dwelling on Obstacles. Anybody who rides a mountain bike knows that if you focus on a rock in the middle of the path and you dwell on that, you're going to be drawn right into right it into and hit it. it. The practical application there is, is are lessons on how to keep a positive attitude and not let negativity take over. If right, you dwell mention, on negative Mention a couple of things. This is really good for today. I didn't okay. plan on doing All right. this, but we're here, <laughs> so let's do it. All right. So a couple of things. Uh, a couple of things about... Positive attitude. How do you oh. keep a positive attitude? Okay. Well, I think we just talked about some so, of those. Well, some of those things. You face, your, you face your challenges straight on. You recognize that there's hope, uh, that you are not a victim, that you have control over your life. One of the challenges that we face when we when we are hit by 
uh, really devastating circumstances or even a, a series of minor ones that build up is we start feeling like it's not our responsibility, we're helpless. When we start feeling you know, helpless, is, is, is all hope goes that out the door. we gain a, a victim mentality. Right. We, but, but the pain that comes with accepting our responsibility for that is also the empowerment that allows us to overcome that helpless feeling take control of our lives, and do something about it. Good stuff. Yeah. Otherwise, we end up, as I say in the book, um, helplessly wandering around waiting for the next meteor to hit us. You know, And, and that's, that's not life. Life is <coughs> us taking charge and doing something, not standing by waiting for the next calamity. Well, the other thing I learned in there, that um, there's a point where we, for me, I had to learn to stop trying to fix everybody's life. Oh, yes. I, read, I needed to concentrate on my mm -hmm. own. <clears throat> and I was a fix-it person. That's what I do in business. I fix things. I get it right. I work at it until it's proper and done the way it should be and makes the amount of money and all those things. And somewhere I began trying to fix people, and I was just full of advice about fixing people. And I looked up one day, and I realized no one changes until they really have this tremendous desire to get out of right. where they are. Whatever level that's on, there are no changes until we begin to take personal action and that starts in the government all the way down to young children until we make that decision. And you've nailed some of this stuff. Name of the book again. Life on the Narrow Path. And the subtitle is A Mountain Biker's Guide to Spiritual Growth in Troubled Times. That's great. Yeah. Can I just ask how much um, sports have helped you get through this? Because I swim every morning. Oh, okay. And I, I was a professional swimmer and synchronized swimming many years ago. And then I love to be in the water. Somehow, when I'm working out, no matter how mild it might be, <clears throat> because I work out in a therapy pool that's 91 degrees, you really can't swim in a pool that way. But we jump up and down and have a lot of fun. Um, I seem to forget everything else that's going on. It just is kind of, I lay it aside. I, I don't think about laying it aside. I just don't think about it. And I give my brain a rest. Well, I, I was... Uh, uh, um, swimmer and a water pol polo player in oh. college, so we have a common okay. experience there. Okay. But I still, yeah. at, at my age, uh, and I'm in my mid 50s, I'll ride uh, between uh, 40 and 50 miles a week, uh, even through the winter. Uh, in the winter, it's more on a stationary bike, but uh, I do get outside quite a bit. But, but uh, in good weather, anything above 38 degrees is good weather to me. Mm -hmm. No, and uh, <laughs> and I'll I'll ride there I'll ride that that distance and in the, on, on my bike either a mountain bike or a road bike depending on and that is exactly my experience I things work out in your mind you can calm yourself you can focus away you let your stress flow out of you and uh, just uh, just now, feel how, good how about, about what somebody you're doing. that's um, they can't walk that much so they're they're in the house. Mm -hmm. and that's difficult because you're homebound maybe and <clears throat> we do have a wonderful elderly pop population here in utah we do and uh, we have crummy weather today is a crummy day if you love today julia curry was on with me yesterday and she loves the ice crystals that are everywhere like the dew has frozen forget that i want it warm mm -hmm. but some people love that but i wonder what what does a person go through who's home all day, every day, and maybe alone. It's very difficult. Well, we're getting back close mm -hmm. to a piece of silver again. I know. The concept that, I'm, I'm, of being I'm alone. I'm it. <laughs> but the, uh, um, one of, I guess the, the answer that I would give to that would be that there are many ways to be active. Not all of them are physical. You do what you can physically, but maintaining mental activity. My wife and I, um, some of our quiet, enjoyable times together, uh, we'll play something. We, we love to play Scrabble uh, be, because she beats me so often at it. And, <laughs> she, I, and I keep coming it. to Rack and <laughs> trying to win one. But, but we call that our anti-Alzheimer's game. <laughs> it's true. Because it keeps us mentally active. Um, at a, and, and plus we can, you know, we and can and have a good interaction, just the two of us. And so now I'll give away a secret. One mm -hmm. of the reasons I'm back on the radio is because all of the 20 years on before, um, I didn't use a script and I, I just never have. And I maybe have questions and background and a little information. But I've decided that that keeps too, much, too many holes in the Swiss cheese from happening. And uh, then I was off the air for a mm. number of years. 
And so I realized I couldn't remember phone numbers anymore. It was having a little more difficulty. So I got in, two things happened. I found a product that helped change that, which I talk about is my sponsor. And my mind has cleared up tremendously. But going back on the radio challenges you to think. And right. that's what you're doing in Scrabble. Right. You have to think. So that would be one of the things you would suggest, reading or playing board games or... In, in my case, having an 11-year-old daughter does that, too. Okay. <laughs> that, that could do it in everybody's She's our case. tail end, and she's, uh, <laughs> she keeps us extremely mentally active. <laughs> That's great. Uh, we're going to take a little commercial break here at the bottom of the, almost the bottom of the hour, and we'll be back in just a minute. And we're going to now, we're going to talk just about this book. And uh, we're going to give away the first caller and the fifth caller, 801 Three six two nine five five two. Leave your name and phone number so I can call you back because Clark Burbage has given us two gifts today to give to you before Christmas. We're in downtown Provo. We're easy to find, and we'll work out an arrangement so you can come and pick them up and have it for a gift for someone for Christmas. So give us a call, 801-362-9552. We'll be right back. You don't have to travel far to look how the LDS Church carried out the Lord's mandate in taking the restored gospel to the entire world. Fernando and Keta Gomez have now opened in Provo an extension of a museum that was established in Mexico City 20 years ago with the objective of collecting, preserving, and exhibiting such information. Their inspiration comes from his and Consuelo's legacy, which inspired them in securing such incredible Mormon history. The seeds planted by hundreds of missionaries from Zion since the 1800s are reflected in the exhibits along with testimonies of local Mexican saints. Newspapers that were published in Mexico during the 1800s give not only the history of the LDS Church, but detail its doctrine as well. The Museum of Mormon Mexican History opens Tuesday to Friday, 2 to 6, Saturday, 10 to 6. Visit us at 1501 North Canyon Road in Provo. Admission is free. For group visits or information, call 801-830-1468, 830-1468. Hi, I'm Mary Louise Zeller, an independent distributor with Kayani. I, in three years, have achieved the rank of Blue Diamond. Let me tell you about one of Kayani's three products they call the triangle of health it's called sunset kayani sunset it's based on wild alaskan sockeye salmon so it's a very very high quality omega-3 fish oil and it's guaranteed to be free of toxic chemicals like cadmium mercury pcbs all of which cause cancer but this is guaranteed to be mercury free what makes this product a breakthrough in human health product though are the vitamin e tocotrienols that it's preserved by and these tocotrienols if you even go to pubmed.gov, public medicine, the U.S. National Medical Library online. Put in the search box tocotrienols and you will see that it, if it's not talking about cardiovascular health, brain health, it's talking about being anti-tumor, anti-cancer. This product is a breakthrough in human health. Yep. Hi. I'm- okay, we're back. I'm, uh, my guest today is Clark Burbage. He is an author. He has a financial background and he runs a company called iTalk. Is that it? I'm the CFO. You're the CFO. But I'll let them know that you promoted me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. He's the chief financial officer there. And uh, today he is here because I wanted you to know about this book. We are giving away two of the. He is giving away two of the books today. Call 801-362-9552. First and fifth caller will receive this book, and we'll arrange for you to come down to the studio and pick it up. So now we're going to spend the next half hour right up to the hour, 1 o'clock, um, on um, this book about the story. You can read it. In t- we can sit here and read it less time than we're going to take to talk about it. But it's a, the, what it's about is the book before you ever start the story. So um, I ask where the crossover happened. You've given the background on that where you decided to write this particular book. Uh, you have other book, and you may ha- do you have another one in the works? Yeah, the guy, glad to talk about that at the end. Okay, if you wish. let's mm-hmm. do it. Then let's start talking about this book. Mm-hmm. You somewhere you had to sit down and begin to begin, and you said it, you wrote it in just a few minutes. About an hour. Um, uh, should I? You want me to tell just a little bit about oh, the I story? Oh, I want to tell Okay. <laughs> well, I'll keep a little secret, well, so they'll want to wanna, they'll yes. want to read this book. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I want you to show the illustrations, and we'll describe them to our radio audience. 
The, uh, the book is about an 11-year-old homeless orphan boy who lives in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. He is utterly alone and invisible, as many of us feel from time to time. And uh, he lives from hand to mouth. He cleans out a stable as an odd job and decides, you know, that might be a good place to go back and sleep one night. So he slips in a few nights later without the innkeepers knowing to sleep there for the night. And he, um, he discovers that it's the stable on the night of all nights. Now, this young boy's from Samaria. He does not understand the Jewish history, the prophecies, so he doesn't fully understand what's going on, but he feels it in his heart. And we see this uh, whole experience of the birth of the Savior and the wonderful things that happened that night through the eyes of this young boy, who kind of gets it a little bit, but feels it. He has only one possession, and that's a piece of silver. That's what ties the story together, beginning and end. It's a small silver ring that hangs around his neck on a piece of twine that his mother gave him as, he was, um, as she was dying on the road from Samaria. He gives that to the Savior, and uh, the rest of the night is told about in the book, the experience he has. He goes back, as we often do after a wonderful experience, to our difficult lives, same old problems, same old challenges, and grows to be a man. Later as an adult, still living on the fringe of society, he meets the Savior again. And that, in that meeting, he finally understands the significance of the first meeting, the importance of the Savior himself, and his own value. This is meant to be read together as, as families, parents and children, grandparents and grandchildren, husband and wives, so that you can have one of those rare, special spiritual moments together. I like to say, and I've seen this happen in my own family and in some of the test readings we've done, we spend all our lives trying to help our children understand how we feel about the Savior and what it meant to us when we came to know him. And uh, this is a wonderful opportunity at the end of the book where you can turn to your child or your grandchild and you'll see it in their eyes and all you'll need to say is you see that's how it feels. It's a wonderful book, a wonderful book. I appreciate um, your giant spirit and that uh, it, it comes through in the book. Um, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions. Sure. Um, how did you decide on an 11-year-old Daniel to represent the main character? Is this from some something you drew on? So is it something about you? Well, I've raised six boys. <coughs> oh, really? And, okay. Uh, it, that, that point in time where uh, young, young people are so inquisitive and curious and yet they're nervous about interfering... We, we catch, I was able to catch all of those moments with Daniel. And it draws the young people into the story because they can relate to this, this boy who, who didn't know where his place was in life. He, did, he, he felt alone. He felt uncared for. He didn't have for. a place. He didn't have a place. And so many teenagers and young people that I've worked with uh, throughout my life are struggling to find where they fit in. Daniel's the same. He doesn't know how he fits in. And so immediately, he, uh, young people are able to relate to this, teenagers as well, because who, who, who has more trouble than finding out how to fit in teenagers. than teenagers? And then uh, later on in the story, as, as Daniel meets the Savior again as an adult, I think this is when the parents unexpectedly find themselves being pulled into the book we all have gone through difficult times. We have tender memories that lie just below the surface yep. uh, that are a result of those many challenging experiences that have made us the wonderful people who we are in the long That's run. True. And as you read about Daniel and his final realization of the importance of his life, that it was not for nothing, that he mattered, that he has value to the Savior and that there is a place for him, and that he's never been alone. It pulls those tender heartstrings on the parents. I had a, one, one lady, if I may, sure, who, uh, who sure. re was reading this story to her child, eight-year-old daughter, 
And they were reading, uh, and, and she was doing the reading, the daughter was doing the experiencing. And she got to a point in the book where she was so tearful and so tender that she couldn't continue. And she told me later that her eight-year-old turned to her and she said, Mommy, would you like me to finish this story for us? <laughs> and she said yes. And, and so her eight-year-old finished reading the last few pages. And she said, you know, it was just a fabulous experience that, uh, that, that, that those things happen. You can't create them. They just happen. This book makes it happen, I will tell you, because I had the experience. And I want to go back to Daniel. <clears throat> I have a, some grandchildren, and um, I could see several of them in this character because he found himself cold and lonely and had bedded down for the night when he heard something. There's not an 11-year-old in the world that wouldn't have gotten up from his bed of straw to see what was going on next to him in a stall. And uh, he heard the cries of a woman and then the cries of a babe. And that moment, something began to happen to him, and we feel it. I mean, I felt it. I'm sure others have. I felt it from all directions at that moment. And I thought, if there's a grandparent that cannot figure out what to do for Christmas, this book is it. And uh, what do you think? Did you write this for grandparents when you started? or Because it, it's a perfect Christmas gift from a grandparent. Well, I interestingly enough that you would, and we haven't talked about this before, no. but uh, if you look at the dedication of the book, it is dedicated to my grandchildren. Open that up because um, it's a beautiful illustration. It, of course, it, it's the first thing I saw, and the dedication reads like... It, it says, for all my grandchildren, Christopher, Courtney, those are two that are born... And those other angels yet to grace our presence. Because I don't know uh, what the names will be. Right. They're not here yet, but I know <laughs> they'll be coming at some point. But that, uh, this is written by a grandparent to his grandchildren. So it, it was written great, with that in with mind. That in mind. <laughs> it's a great story. But it's also, and this one I started out talking about you at the top, at the top of the hour, this is written for every age. And uh, you can read this in 10 minutes. It's, it's simply one of those books. Okay, so I finished it, wiped up the tears, and read it again. <laughs> and it has that kind of impact on people. And then I began making a list of all the people that I felt should have the book. And so it's, um, I'm going to call myself on the phone in a few minutes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and win one of these books. So today, if you're the first or the fifth caller, and then if that doesn't happen for you today then please find a bookstore. In, uh, I know Desert Book carries this book. They can, you can find it online. Is it in, on Amazon? It's on Amazon. It's on, in, in Barnes & Noble and Desert Book. It's on their online sites as well. And if they don't have it, um, they have it in their warehouses, or they'll order it, and you can, they can get it overnight or two nights. To you. So you yeah. still get it before Christmas. It's been very popular, and it's sold <coughs> out in a lot of places, but it's still very available online and by order. Uh, the two books today will be autographed by the author, Clark Burbage. And um, I'm sorry that he told you his age because I was going to tell you that I knew his father at East High School. <laughs> and so um, actually I had, all, you know, I'm closer to his age and his father was a lot old. No. So they're going to now figure out that I'm probably older than 52. <laughs> so, but I did. And he was a great man. He was a great young man. His father was. And it's really fun to meet somebody who's has that same giant spirit that his dad had. And I understand your dad has passed away. He has. He has. And those are some of the experiences we have when, when we, need to, uh, we need to face him and kind of keep a special place in our heart oh, yeah. that won't ever be filled. And it's okay if you have that space in your heart that can't ever be filled quite the same way. But your heart can grow to let all the other wonderful people in too without diminishing that space that you're holding in my case, for my mom and dad, who, who are passed your mom away gone now. Too? She is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a time of year that we certainly do a lot of remembering, and this is a great way to bring it all back and have that, those wonderful feelings, and they're, they're all filled with love. I think that's what I felt when I finished this, was a great amount of love. And you talk about unconditional love, that that's kind of the mode in which you wrote this, about unconditional love, like the Savior's love. Mm -hmm. There's no judgment there. <clears throat> so then, um, the book's available. We've talked about that. How about after Christmas? Would this be a book still to give away? 
Well, we're actually um, setting up the publisher. Uh, my publicity people are are going to a convention in uh, in January oh. because this is a great Easter book. Oh, you're uh, This right. does tie together the two iconic uh, moments in history, yes, the, the birth and the crucifixion, the atonement. And because of that, it's a wonderful opportunity for those who would like to share it at that time of year as well. Great idea. That's mm-hmm. a wonderful idea. So it's going to be a year-round book then. It's going to stay on my coffee table, I'll tell you <laughs> that. Um, now, I want to talk about, I called them illustrations, but mm-hmm. in talking about this book with you before we went on the air, really and truly, these are art prints. They're art paintings. And uh, I, I have someone coming on tomorrow or on uh, Thursday an artist that I just love her work, and it's the, uh, it's like the old masters, mm-hmm. the subtle painting. And uh, she's got Joseph and Mary and the babe, and then a picture of Christ. And all right, these these have that feeling. It's like an old master painting. Um, so let's open it up because um, I under, well, you, they've already seen them, right? Kelly, you've been showing some of the art prints on about the book. So let's describe them to our radio audience. Okay. Um, <clears throat> First of all, her name. The, the artist's mm-hmm. name is Annie Henry. She graduated from BYU in fine arts uh, just about a year ago. She's the daughter of a fabulous artist, Carrie Henry, and so was trained all her life to, uh, to become a great artist. She studied in Italy, um, and she studied the great classic masters of Europe. And when I got to the point of, of needing to illustrate this story, I had gone through uh, dozens of artists, and I couldn't find the right one. Uh, There were lots of cartoonish or animated artists, and this is a real story that I wanted people to relate to in a real way, especially young people. And I love the grandmasters, uh, the great artists of Europe, so I was looking for something like this. And uh, Annie paints in the in, in the classical Italian way. She used t- uses texturing as well as colors, and she provided eight uh, full-size oil paintings for this book, wow. originally done for this book to match the story, and then another nine uh, sketches, charcoal sketches that are also gorgeous. Uh, for, so there are 18 uh, full-color and charcoal sketches, all artworks of Annie, and all original for this book. So I had two weeks left when I uh, was, was desperate. I went to a friend of mine and said, I need, you know, we're down to the deadline. Uh, and uh, he said, well, there's the daughter of this, this artist you already considered. Why don't you check her gallery out? Her name's Annie Henry. I went to the gallery uh, on the computer, and I found one of her paintings called uh, Lady in a, Woman in a Red Shawl. And I called my wife, wife over, and I said, look, Leah, she can do Mary. And then we looked at some more, and I saw a painting of a young boy. And I turned to my wife again, and I said, she can do Daniel. So I called her on the phone. We chatted. She'd never illustrated a book before. I sent her my manuscript, and the next morning she called me, and she said, you have to let me do this book. <laughs> I love it. She said, I know exactly <clears throat> how to do it. I love it. So that's, that's the story, and I really think the artwork and the story were meant to be together uh, because they create such a powerful message uh, that draws children. And one thing I like to do with this art is uh, with my, my children or with others I read it to, I'll have them pick an individual in the book they relate to, oh. and then I'll have them play that role and say, okay, what... What is that person thinking? Why are they there? How do you feel about what you're seeing? And where are you going next? And what are you going to do with that knowledge in your life? That helps them appreciate and live the story as well as reading it. Oh, that's, that's what beautiful. this book is meant for. <clears throat> Annie's last name is spelled H-E-N-R-I-E, H-E-N-R-I-E. And I understand she is local. Mm-hmm. Yes, she is. And this is her first book. Book. This is so her first illustration for a book. For yeah, a she book. has a number of paintings. <clears throat> She's been in the Ensign magazine this year. And oh, also she has some of her original paintings in Desert Book. In fact, one of the paintings you've shown uh, here, the nativity, the full nativity scene, is uh, framed and for sale in the Desert Book in downtown Salt Lake. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, And she's how old? 
She's about 26. She oh, might be 27 by now. 20, so. That's She's doing pretty good to have this uh, happen She's incredibly all talented. In her yeah. early life. Um, so it's a beautiful book. We're talking about a piece of silver. Uh, that is the name of the book. And so I'm going to ask you, how did you happen to come up with this title? Oh, well, it, titles, for me, titles <coughs> kind of come afterwards when you realize what... I love writing because mm-hmm. I discover the story as I write it. It's almost like it's almost like watching it happen in front of you and, and you're living the story. You're Daniel and, oh, what happens next and so on. Oh, he, he's going to give a gift. What's that gift? You know, and it's a wonderful experience for me to, to go through that process just like you do when you read the book. Right. And so... Uh, it seemed to me that this piece of silver was the, the, the key token in this book that tied Daniel's early life and the Savior's birth to that iconic event at the end uh, where the Savior is crucified. And the piece of silver plays a role in that, at that point as, as well in a very tender way and ties the two moments uh, in, in both their lives together. So it was natural for that to become the title of the book, I think. Well, when I, of course, we think of the ring as a, eternal, no beginning and mm-hmm. no end. <clears throat> so I particularly appreciated the symbolism there. And then the way you used it in the book is uh, really very tender. Um, the memories of his mother, this was the only thing he had from his childhood, was this that had been his mother's ring. And um, so it's, it's a lovely story and brings out all the goodness in each one of us when we're reading it. And you've just given me an idea of, of um, I'm giving this to one of my teenage grandsons. Mm-hmm. And uh, he is an actor. He's done a lot of work at the Sarah Theater and at the Hale Theater uh, and then some school productions. <clears throat> and I don't know that that's what he's going to do forever because he's, what, 14 now. But um, I... I think I'm going to have him read this and maybe buy some other copies and have take individual parts mm-hmm. to read this story because it has such a nice message and it's very it comes together very quickly but the power behind it is amazing and I'm just going to say that it's an ama- mm-hmm. oh look at the pictures up all right leave that for a minute Kelly <clears throat> we're streaming the picture to our pat.utahvalleylive.com if you're not on that and then you've got your radio on and you'd like to see it, it's pat.utahvalleylive.com. We also archive all of our shows, and so when this is over, you'll be able to watch it. It'll be up for 20 years at least. And uh, so describe this, if you would, to the radio audience. Well, the, uh, the picture that's up right now is the, uh, the picture that this is from Daniel's point of view after he's just come around the edge of the stall that he was staying in. And he sees Joseph and Mary holding the baby. He sees some visitors. He doesn't know who these visitors are. Um, but we know that they're shepherds who have come in from the fields. And there are several on their knees and some standing in the back um, worshiping. And there, there's the, the lamb and... There's some horses and yeah. some other, you know, some sheep and and uh, animals. Annie, Annie loves to draw animals, so she'll sneak animals in. That's easy in a, in a, in a manger to it justify is, that. It so is. she did a wonderful job um, with the coloring. It's, it's, uh, I don't know how to describe it's muted. the color. The colors it's, are muted. It's, yeah. They're not screaming at you, and there's so much gauche going on all the time in our Christmas season. Mm-hmm. Bright colors and lights, and uh, some are okay because we love light, but this is very muted. It's almost as if it was by moonlight. Right. The way she has painted it, the light would be by She moonlight. works in, in shades and mm-hmm. lighting, and the, there are a lot of golds mm-hmm. and browns and, and those earth kinds tones. of mm-hmm. earth tones, as you might expect in those era. There weren't uh, they're bright colors. Uh, hay isn't a bright color. It's no. hay color. And, uh, and the lighting is, is very carefully done in each one of these uh, pictures. Now, this she has done very nicely because we see Mary and it looks like blue, kind of a blue mm-hmm. dress and a, a shawl, a with shawl a, over a, her head. And this is a great scene, an and, absolutely great scene. And this is when Daniel is, of course, finally um, had the courage to, to intervene. And he's been called over by the first family 
I like to call him that. And and he's now helping hold uh, hold the child, Jesus, and just about ready to uh, give his gift to him. Let's share again where people can get this, if you would, Clark. I'm talking with Clark Burbage today. He is the author of A Piece of Silver. He also has another book out. A Life on the Narrow Path. Life on the Narrow mm-hmm. Path. And uh, both of these books can be purchased through uh, almost any bookstore and online. And uh, if they want to email you, is there an email address? Because I didn't see one on the book. Mm-hmm. It may be there. But uh, I find in our community that we do like to communicate. I remember years ago there was a book by, uh, oh, what's his name, uh, Two Brothers. It was something about Charlie's Mountain mm-hmm. oh, years and years ago. And I, it was the first time I'd ever called an author. It was before we had email. And uh, I was so taken by this story. And uh, I wanted to call on it. It was, oh, 30 years ago. Um, but people are going to want to get hold of you. So is there an email address they can well, find you? Well, you can go to my website, okay. which is www.apieceofsilver.com, so just the title of the book. Uh, there's, uh, ser- there are several pages there. Uh, one of them has uh, the contact information on it. Okay. And you can email me that way. Okay, that would be good. Mm-hmm. So just look him up on his website. Right. And so it's apieceofsilver.com. You can also order the book on the first page of that website. You just click order now and it'll take you right to the publisher and you can you can get it, is it uh, the same in a couple online of days. as it is at the bookstore or a little bit different. Well that comes that one puts you directly in touch with the publisher. Okay. If you were to order at a bookstore, of mm-hmm. course the uh, you'd order through that bookstore right. and they'd contact the publisher. Okay. E- either way, you can it's get it pretty quickly. It's about the same quickly. thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. The same amount of money, you think? Um, yeah. About mm-hmm. 16 it, It's It's sixteen ninety nine plus, tax. plus okay, some tax. tax. And there'll be, there'll be a little <coughs> shipping depending on who Beautiful you order book. from. Beautiful book. If you do, if you get this today or tomorrow, you should be able to get it by Saturday. But do it very quickly. Um, I do have a, one last question. And I think when we all read anything, we get a little something. I've started books I couldn't finish, and so I didn't get much out of that. Um, But I've also read books that I wanted to pick up and reread and have done that because I got so much out of it. Uh, Sometimes it was just one line, Mm -hmm. but it made such a difference to me personally. So what would you like to have people get out of this book? And let's go by the ages. Well, I think that this book is written in layers. So okay. there are messages for each age group. But I'll just, I'll just give you three messages. Okay. And I think they'll appeal to each, each age group in different ways. First of all, that you're never alone. That uh, your Heavenly Father is always there. And he's mindful of you. Secondly, there is a place for you. No matter how hard it might be to find your place in life at various times, there is ultimately a place for you. And thirdly, there is someone that knows your name. Uh, you are not invisible. Uh, you are an important part person, and you matter. So uh, I guess those are the primary messages that I tried to convey here. Right at the end of the book, that was made so clear. We know it intellectually. We think about it. Um, I remember when I was younger, I wondered if the Lord knew my name. I think kids that are raised in any religious setting have that question at some point, does anybody know I'm really here? It can hit us when we're teenagers, it can happen when you're 20, 30, 40, 50, or whenever. And uh, right at the end of the book, that became so clear that it was almost a <gasps> <laughs> I almost had that reaction, you know, an <gasps> aha yeah. kind of thing, and it was so real to me, that's where the tears came. Oh. <laughs> and so um, you mentioned one lady that had had, uh, and thank you for sharing uh, your thoughts about what people should get out of this because they're wonderful and I noticed that you signed with the book you signed for me with one of those sentiments and I appreciate that. Um, you had mentioned one story that a woman had shared with you. Are there others that come to mind? The reaction overall mm-hmm. for the, about the book. Uh, we're curious about you as a new author and uh, curious about your reaction to the public. Well, I, I love hearing those stories. I've, uh, this is now such a part of my life that I don't have the same perspective as others, and I love hearing how others uh, feel about the book. I have a very longtime friend 
who's a grizzled veteran lawyer. A Hard, grizzled. Yeah, hardened <laughs> by the world and, and uh, has his own story. And he and his wife uh, have a copy of the book. I gave one to him because he's such a good friend. And he said, this is a, a wonderful, but I, wh- who do I read it to? My kids are all grown and gone. They're all out of state. He hadn't read it. He's, he, he, just, he, had, this he hadn't book read it. it. And, and uh, I said, well, why don't you take it home and you and your wife, before you go to bed tonight, uh, read it together. And they're, they're in their late 50s. And uh, he called me the next morning and was all choked up. And he said, you know, we thought this was a book to read with children, but it's not. It's a book for anybody to read with anybody else. And they, uh, they had those tender moments that I talked about earlier as they read it. And they shared that together as a husband and wife, which is, uh, you know, we, we get running so fast in this world today. And to be able to sit down as a husband and wife and share a moment like that is precious. That is precious. Yeah. That's, a, that's a great story to share. Now go to the other extreme. Uh, your children have read it? M- yes. And mm-hmm. tell me what happened there. Because kids can be very blasé about their parents. Um, well, you know, you, no one no one can ignore you like the people in your family. <laughs> it, it, well, I have to I have to always deal with the it's not it's not a book, it's my dad's book and I've been hearing this about this book for a year and a half. But uh, I I guess the best test was my 11-year-old daughter and and she uh, she read the fireball. She, yeah, yeah. <laughs> our social our social calendar maker. <laughs> And she enjoyed it very much. She'd heard the story a hundred times. I've told it to her. Uh, but she enjoyed the pictures and the combination and, and relived the whole thing again uh, when, she, uh, when she read through it. I do want to talk about the new book, too. Oh, that's yeah. right. We've got a few so. minutes. Let's talk about the new book. Thank you. Okay. Not that I need to plug no, it or no, anything. No, I want you but, to. I want, we're but we're almost out of time. That's how we get you to come back. I'm happy to do it. Uh, the, the new book is just gone into editing, final editing, so I've just finished with my drill sergeant. <laughs> and uh, and, and the, they don't do anything to you where the bruises show. <laughs> That's right. It's called uh, Land, uh, Giants in the Land. And Giants in the Land. Giants in the Land. It's a story of, a, of an agricultural society. You think medieval times, a lot of farming. Uh, those kinds of things, where they have always had giants living with them, doing all the heavy lifting. They work hard. These, the the regular sized people work hard too. But whenever they have something that's too big or a threat that's too great, they have um, giants to take care of it for them. Well, one day they wake up and the giants have disappeared. So the challenge is, how do we carry on? What do we do? And there's only one young man who's a farmer, who agrees to go out into the world to try to find the giants, and he does. So it's an exciting story for tweens and teens and their parents to read together because, again, it's written in layers with parables. And what it teaches us to do, without giving away the thrills and spills in the ending, is we all have people in our lives who have been our mentors, our giants, who are those people who we've looked up to and depended on what eventually they all pass. It's true. Or they go somewhere. And uh, and we have to learn how to be giants in our, ourselves. And what they, Thomas, the young man of the story, discovers is being a giant doesn't have anything to do with how big you are. It has to do with the size of your heart. And he carries that message back and... and and uh, that's it's that's kind story. of the story. It's yeah. a and great it's, story. It's, I've, having lost both my parents, I know how that feels and how to overcome it and it's going to be ready in the spring june june it'll mm-hmm. be ready so we know we're going to get you back at least by june happy to do it. all right thank you you've been listening to uh, clark burbage and uh, pat sharanian happy to have you with us today for and thank you for joining us and we'll be back again i'll be back again tomorrow and the book we've been talking about today is a piece of silver by clark burbage and we appreciate him so much and thank you and i wish you a happy day and safe day and we'll talk to you later bye-bye Thank <laughs> you.